evening and welcome to the chat of Northern Virginia and DC's second virtual lecture highlighting ADHD Awareness Month. Tonight, we are so pleased to have Dr. John Thomas from the ADHD College Success Guidance Program present ADHD in the Workplace, Career Fit, Interface, and Resolution. We hope you will also attend our third and final lecture that will be on October 24th, featuring Michelle Mullally and giving her a presentation entitled, The Importance of Assessing and Treating Anxiety and Trauma in Understanding ADHD Symptoms. My name is Pam Barton and I am the coordinator for the chapter and I welcome you to this um, lecture tonight. Please keep your videos off and your mics muted during the presentation. Please, if you have any questions, type them into the chat and one of our board members will be moderating the questions to the presenters. Our chapter, Chad of Northern Virginia and DC, is one of many chapters in the Chad National Organization, and as such, aligns with the national mission of improving the lives of those affected by ADHD. We are a volunteer organization of trained professionals who offer support in a number of ways. In addition, addition to offering our yearly ADHD Awareness Month lectures and our free in-person resource fairs, we also offer monthly lecture series on the second Tuesday evening of most months. We also have support groups for parents, students, and adults. While we are all volunteers, we cover other expenses through membership dues, donations, and sponsorships. We urge you to become a member if you are not already one. Now I'd like to highlight some of our uh, wonderful sponsors that provided us uh, you know, the sponsorship for our, for our resource fair that we just had on the 7th of the month. And it was awesome, um, thanks to our sponsors. So let me get started with these people here. The, this is our gold sponsor group, that's Child and Adult Psychiatry, Cortona Academy, Fusion Academy, McLean School and Thrive Emerge. Our thanks to our silver sponsors, which is Bass Educational Services, Commonwealth Academy, Elevated Learning Solutions, Focus Collegiate, and Learning RX. And now to introduce our speaker for this evening. For over 30 years, John Thomas LPC has been involved in research, treatment, and training with adolescents and young adults who have ADHD. As founder of the ADHD College Success Guidance Program, he utilized this experience to develop an experiential residential college readiness success training program and an affiliated academic coaching model. His book, Thriving at the Edge of Chaos, Making ADHD a Superpower in College and Career, published in 2019, details the program and its outcomes. And Dr. Thomas is in process of publishing the second edition of the book. And without further ado, here's Dr. Thomas. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Pam. Am I on? Well, we see you, but we don't see your presentation yet. Well, that's because I haven't turned on the share button yet. Oh, I see. And here we go. So, <clears throat> Um, as Pam mentioned, um, I've worked with uh, folks with ADHD for the last 30, well, it's now 35 years. <clears throat> Time does fly. Um, and generally, it's been with uh, young adults and and uh, late adolescents. <clears throat> so people who are in uh, the process of finding their path in, in through college training and into the workplace, and then once into the workplace, uh, settling in. 
So what, what I've done for our presentation tonight is broken this down into three categories, co career fit, interface, and resolution. But talk more about what all that means uh, as we get into it. Well, let's see here. Okay, so what I would like to do is build off of, uh, uh, Pam mentioned the last presentation, Andrew Brenner did a magnificent presentation on transitioning from college to into the world of work and covered lots of areas about, <clears throat> oh, finding your fit, your, uh, selecting a career, uh, finding the job, doing interviewing, all the things that you need to do to get into that uh, to 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 get into what you want to do after college, and I I just one of the things that stuck. She pulled up this quote: "It's not how well you can do the job, it's how well you can talk about doing the job. That's what sells you on the job. But then once you get the job, well, yeah, you need to do more than talk. So um, let's see here. <clears throat> so here's a couple of other quotes I wanted to add to this." Um, I thought I made this up, but Pam said, Dale Carnegie said this, success is getting what you want. Happiness is wanting what you get. And so, you know, success, you've, you've got the job then, and now to be happy in that job requires something of a fit, um, a, a, an interface, um, ability to make ADHD, make, make yourself a person with ADHD, um, interfaced with what's required of you. Some of the stuff that pops up that, that gets in the way is uh, challenges that people with ADHD have. These are you know, just, just a handful of them, but the real common ones where people have difficulty uh, in, the, in the workplace is we need novelty and variety. I, I remember working at a, a factory when I was working my way through college it was my version of hell, doing the same thing every single day. It was, um, <clears throat> it was very difficult. So having something of a, of a variety of what we do is very important. Variability of performance is another area. Um, uh, variability of performance, meaning uh, what, what, what I do this week may not be the same as next week. I may be really on this morning, but this afternoon, maybe not so well. Uh, the the uh, Russell Barker's uh, Barkley's uh, comment was, "You do it right once, and they hold it against you forever." So once you you know we, we, we're expected to be consistent in our performance, and to some degree that's possible. But there's be uh, there's some things that need to happen in order to make that variability uh, uh, be at a lower curve. Organization's another issue. Um, organization of uh, you know, workspace, um, <clears throat> organization of schedules of tasks. That's a pretty common challenge. Uh, timeliness, uh, also spelling. Spelling's an issue for people with ADHD. Uh, looks like timeliness is a is is a, a you know being on time, being hitting deadlines. These are all areas that people struggle with. Um, <clears throat> so. Just looking at um, these three areas, I want to take a, a, just about 15 or 20 minutes and introduce you to some of the languaging that we use in, in our work, in our, in our program, that helps to understand uh, how people can bring themselves to success in the workplace. Um, I want to just do this briefly, and then um, we're going to transition to a uh, panel discussion we have four people from different, uh, representing different aspects of different parts of the world of work who, who all have ADHD, who volunteered their time to be present tonight. And thank you uh, very much, uh, folks, for, for showing up for uh, for this presentation tonight. We're going to have a uh, just a conversation about what, uh, what ADHD in the workplace is like in your world. And then we'll follow that up with a question and answer. Uh, period. So I believe you were going to be asked to put uh, questions in the chat uh, as, as I move along here. <clears throat> so first area, we, we, we're looking at career fit, interface, and resolution. Career fit, this is, this is the, kind of the language I like to use with uh, young people looking for uh, the next step after college or training. 
we break it down into three categories, job, career, and calling. A job is just something you do for money. It structures your time. Yeah, you maybe get develop some skills, but it's not so heavy on that. You kind of like the, that, that job I had in the factory doing the same thing over and over again. Um, <clears throat> career is all of the above. Plus, it's about enhancing skills. You're in the process of building skills as you uh, move along in your career. It also reflects something of your interests, the things that you enjoy doing. Um, and we'll jump down to values, the things that are important to you. These are things in our belief system. Sometimes they're just below the conscious level, but we know when when we're uh, hitting something of value to us. Uh, remember working with a, a person some years back who uh, got got situated in a in a program where she could get her uh, doctorate degree and she was getting paid a salary working in research only to find out that uh, she started the work that uh, their work um, among the subjects they work with are primates and it it was just a real challenge to her value system and she had to move on uh, so temperaments um, <clears throat> just temperaments are something of our disposition uh, that we're born into the world with. Uh, I, I like to say that many people with ADHD are uneasy in the harness. We, we, um, we with the choice of close or distant supervision, we kind of like uh, distant supervision. We like to run our own show. You see a lot of entrepreneurs uh, who have ADHD. It's pretty common uh, that that you know just close supervision is not as uh, we're not so easy with it. Um, single station or mobile. Where, your workspace. Do you like sitting in front of the same in, in the, at a desk in front of a computer all day, or do you like moving about the office or moving outdoors or inside or, or you know to between different offices? Um, <clears throat> another thing is a sort of a mixture of temperament, interests, and values is uh, this concept of data people things. All jobs, all careers can be categorized according to the relevance of, of data or information, people and things, tools, materials, machinery, um, the, the degree to which these are involved in work. For example, uh, my work is people first, their data is equally important. And then, you know, I'll play with this computer now and then. So mine's more like people, data, things. Um, and careers match up with who we are in our temperament preference of, of data people things. Some people I work with um, find that they're unhappy in a, in a, in a job in, uh, or their career because their, their fit is, is not the same. Their data people things fit is different than what the job requires. Sometimes that can be accommodated. Sometimes it's just the way it is. Let me bounce back up. <clears throat> so a calling, Calling is all the all the things that career is, plus it's about purpose in life. Now, you ask anyone under 30 what their purpose in life is, and um, it you're you're gonna get a very few people who can tell you that they've even asked that question or been curious about it. Um, because it's not something that we know right up front, it's something that we develop as we move through life. And so a lot of people. Uh, and they're, when they're starting out uh, right out of, of college are not necessarily in a calling. But this is the question, am I in a job career calling? That's one of the first questions about um, that, that we want to look at in terms of career fit. Um, <clears throat> career ladders, are you on the right ladder? Um, back to my early days getting through college, I remember working <clears throat> in a... Uh, for a construction company, I was offered a job as a foreman and I was pretty excited. I'm like, yeah, that's pretty good money, you know, and I'm up here, about right here on that career ladder of construction. And a friend of mine brought up the fact, well, well, John, you're majoring in journalism. You want to be a writer, right? And I'm like, uh, yeah, yeah, but, you know, I got to get through college. He said, well, look, over here, there's this weekly that's wanting to hire a beginning reporter. And I said, what do they pay? Well, minimum wage. Well, I, you know, I'm thinking a lot more over here and said, yeah, well, that's not your career ladder. This is, you know, journalism is your career ladder. And so I thought that idea of um, <clears throat> the, 
the career ladder concept? Am I on the right ladder is a real good question to ask. <clears throat> so moving to career interface, this is about ADHD uh, and how it affects me. <clears throat> and then what the job is looking for, you know, requiring of me and my ADHD. So here's some more language and, a, and another model that we use. <clears throat> Dreamer realist critic, though a way of thinking about how, how our psyches are, are, are um, separated. We, have, we, we can divide ourselves into three parts. The dreamer, this creative part of us that happens when, when we have all the neural connectivity the, uh, in our brain, um, that all, all, um, all zones are firing and um, the we, high functional connectivity uh, is, is when we're in a dreamer state, an idea, creative mode. The, the realist <clears throat> is another part of us that uh, generally located in the prefrontal cortex area of the brain. This is about um, uh, three parts of, of um, <clears throat> choosing a goal, organizing a plan, and executing a plan. These are the main functions of the realist. Figuring out of all these dreams, all these wonderful ideas, what's most important, relevant, doable, necessary and make that a goal <clears throat> and then organize in a plan a sequence of steps for how to accomplish that that goal and then the realist executes that plan we break that down into a couple of steps a few steps here one is getting started some people have difficulty getting started once started they can really roll and maybe having a uh, oh, I don't know, a body double or coming up with some sort of a commitment device to get going is all they need. <clears throat> Others may have difficulty continuing with the task um, due to distractions. They're easily called away. Uh, still others have problems with finishing. It could get up to 90% and then for some reason, for lots of reasons, uh, it's just hard to get it out the door. Sometimes it's part and parcel of the of the critic, which we'll talk about next. Um, and some people have all of problems in all of these areas. And this another word for the realist, of course, is executive function. And this has always uh, been been uh, for for a long time something we've uh, looked at in, in ADHD land in terms of some of the basics for difficulty in functioning in academics and in the workplace. Um, the critic is a different part of our brain. It's the critical thinking part. It's the part that steps back and looks at, you know, the dream and, and, and the, the realist uh, work of the realist, the plan, and says, okay, how could this go wrong? Um, how, how, could, uh, how can I keep it from going wrong? Is this the best approach? Is there a better way, a more elegant way of, of accomplishing this? Is there, um, uh, is there a better outcome? And that's, of course, the healthy critic. Um, we all have a degree of unhealthy critic. There's that part of us that nags and, uh, you know, the the um, imposter syndrome part of us says, oh, gosh, you can't really do this. You're not smart enough to do this. Or I, um, some of the internalized things that people with ADHD have heard um, throughout their lives in school and perhaps at work that, that come across as critical go into the a part of our, our critical thinking that's, that has a very uh, negative effect and can in fact interrupt um, the dreamer process. Um, so <clears throat> when we look at the problems in the workplace around the dreamer realist critic, generally we, we tend, ADHD people have pretty healthy dreamers and don't have a lot of problem coming up with ideas. The realist um, may may be an area of work. Uh, when you break it down into these categories, where am I having difficulty? This is an area where you can start thinking of uh, how do I interface? How do I fix this problem? It may be I need to come up with a calendar or a, a, um, 
uh, a Gantt chart or some sort of a organizational tool to keep me on track, to break my projects down into goals. Uh, uh, it, it may be that, as I mentioned earlier, you, you might need something, um, a system that helps you to execute a plan, a reward system, um, something of uh, work with whatever's going on with you that, that makes it hard to finish and get something out the door. So this is this is the kind of stuff that's about the interface of, um, of of what what we can do to make our ADHD workable in the workplace. <clears throat> um, resolution. This is when when the problem you know we get to a point where it's like oh maybe it's uh maybe it's a little beyond what I can do on my own. And I might need to step, get ask for some help. I might need to be vulnerable a bit and say, "Hey, I'm having difficulty making these things work. I've tried some things, and 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 it's it, I'm not getting what uh, getting the results I need." Who do you ask that of? And and who who would ideally be there to help you? This could be something of you bring in with a, a coworker, a, a supervisor maybe even HR, um, but it's it's uh, areas where our interface isn't working. And so we need to figure out what the differences are that in our way of functioning and what's required of us so that, that we can resolve the, the problem and, and function as, in, in the way that we were hired to, the way we know we can uh, function. So at some point, it may come down to the issue of ADHD. Um, and there's a question that I, we don't have it on here, but one of the questions is, do I disclose having uh, ADHD? Is it is that something that needs to come up? And if so, when? Um, and the answer I have is that it ideally comes up before it's a problem. Uh, if it's going to be a problem, it needs to come up before it's a problem. And when brought in, it needs to be brought in with without all the red flags that that may pop up. You need to answer the, the questions that are going on in, in the supervisor's mind before bringing the ADHD in. And, you know, I'm fully capable of doing this job and I, I enjoy it. I, I want to be successful in it. And here's some things I've tried to do, and I'm I'm coming up short. Can you can you help me with this? So one of the questions that we have is that we may encounter is well, what is the employer's role in that? And um, we come up with uh, you know ADA uh, requirements an employer is required to provide a reasonable accommodation to a qualified applicant or employee. Um, so. There's a lot of questions that that brings up. One is what is well. First one is what is a reasonable accommodation? Um, here's some examples. Um, these are some of these are are um, they require um, like wearing noise noise canceling headphones. Um, supervisor may not, may. Uh, be really cool with that, but if you're dealing with the public, uh, that that would be a different matter. Um, so that's something that needs to be worked out. Um, <clears throat> permitting remote work, summer all the time. I mean, we're in the age post COVID and post COVID, where that's that's generally uh, easily done, um, unless you're again working with the public. Minimizing marginal functions to allow focus on essential job duties. I guess a better way of saying that was um, don't don't sweat the small stuff. Just focus on the big things, and where possible, um, you know the the um, some of the less important functions let let those go. Um, or let me think here. Essential job duties. Focus more on 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 the outcome. Uh, adjusting or modifying examination of uh, training materials or policies, all of this, you know, that comes down to um, adjusting when you've done all you can do, it comes down then to adjusting to the, um, to the policies 
uh, that uh, uh, in the workplace to the to the the formal and informal um, structures that 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 make up the workplace. On one hand, you want to have everything you can to be successful, but then if if uh, that causes you to stand out, if just like you know people in in college or high school didn't want to have want accommodations because it made them look different. Um, that's challenging. Or if you look like you appear to be getting special treatment, that that may not feel good to you. Uh, let's see. So, alrighty. Um, I've looked, uh, taken some time here to just to sort of flesh out a little bit of the th these three areas. The fit, looking at how how I fit into this particular career. If there's a problem, um, is it is it a good fit? Is it due to it being a good fit? The other level is interface. Am I am I um, you know able to? Am I bringing myself fully into solving problems that have to do with ADHD that I can deal with? And then uh, coming up with solutions, uh, resolutions involved that may involve working. Uh, with in with with someone in the workplace. Uh, let's see. What I'd like to do now is to go ahead and shift gears to our panel discussion. And let me think here. Oops. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask the panel members to go ahead and unmute and bring yourself online. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Hello. There's Tim. Who are we missing here? Yeah. Oh, everybody's on. Okay. Uh, Drew and Matt. So uh, let me ask you first just to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what you do. And uh, go ahead and unmute yourselves, uh, Matt and Tim. And Matt, you're located right up here in the upper left corner. So would you mind starting out? Who are you and what do you do? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, John. My name is Matt Laird. I am a business banker with Atlantic Union Bank uh, here in Central Virginia. Um, best way to summarize what I do, uh, I'm a commercial lender as well as an all-around banker for businesses up to $20 million in revenue. Um, so I service all of their strategic planning, financial planning, uh, lending and deposit needs. Uh, and I work in Charlottesville, Virginia, as well as up and down the Shenandoah Valley from Stanton up to Harrisonburg. Matt, thank you. And thanks for remembering us. Um, uh, after you got famous, yeah, ah. yeah, <laughs> I uh, I never forget where I came from. <laughs> um, Drew, tell us about your who you are and what do you do? And yeah, uh, my name oh, my name is quickly. Andrew Larson. Yeah, I'm sorry. Let me interrupt. I forgot. Part of ADHD is that you know we're doing something, but we're also in the process of 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 a of a path forward we may be involved in in doing something else that's about our future so feel free to share that as well what you're doing and where you're heading thank you drew for that uh excuse that interruption no problem uh my name is andrew larson um i'm a bartender and restaurant consultant in washington dc so i work with restaurants to kind of develop better bar bar programs uh, make better cocktails and give better service. Um, and then I am 
kind of in the very, very beginning stages of getting into ADHD coaching. Um, I've been working with Dr. John for a couple months now, and uh, that's kind of a direction that I want to carry everything as well. Thank you, Drew. Um, part of the dreamer realist critic model I mentioned, uh, we can be either advanced, emerging, or dormant in those three. Um, when I was a young man, I <clears throat> advanced in, in my dreamer, my realist was coming online, it was emerging, but my critic was dormant. I would make the same mistake over and over again. My great uncle uh, uh, worked on his ranch, he'd say, yeah, John, the only way he can learn is to pee on the electric fence every time. And it, it was sort of true with my critic turned off, I, I couldn't learn. Drew, one of the things that you you speak to is your, your uh, dreamer and your critic are both very strong. You're looking at how can this work better? How can I do a better job with this? So, mm -hmm. Aaron, you're next. Boy, Hi, my name is Aaron. Uh, I work for a technology consulting firm. I'm, uh, I work in offensive computer security uh, so basically, uh, have companies, the government, hospitals, oil and gas, um, basically companies from all different industries come to uh, my company and request uh, testing of their network or testing of their um, applications and things like that. And we, uh, I try not to sound obnoxious when I explain my job, but basically they hire us to come in and break their things and then we tell them how we did it and we write a report and ideally help them tell them how to fix it um that's the main part of my my job um i'd say future goals would uh i think a lot of people in our industry would like to write a tool or something uh that everybody in the field uses um that has sort of been a small goal of mine. I've noticed that I really like a particular portion of my job that involves um, setting up uh, the infrastructure. I don't know how technical people are, so I won't go into too much detail. Um, so I like basically the beginning part, that the part that involves setting up my team to uh, do their work for uh, the engagement. We call them engagements. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, you lost me when you said computer. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, so Aaron, it makes sense that what you're you're very strong in the critic. It's like, what's the worst that could happen? How could someone get in here? And you're also coming up with creative ideas and 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 the realist implementing them. So, yours sounds like a real balance there. Sometimes at work, maybe I'm a little bit of a harsh critic of myself. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Tim, t tell us about yourself. Um, thanks. Hi, my name is Tim Case, and I currently wear a couple of hats at the moment. Uh, Full-time, I'm still a, uh, a network engineer, so I do uh, data center design, building out networks for for all that fun stuff. You know, like, like Aaron, I don't want to... I don't want to uh, bore anybody like or make anybody make anybody <laughs> make anybody fall fall asleep or any. Oh yeah, I'm sure we'd have some, I'm sure we'd have some great conversations. <laughs> um, so that's full time, and then part time. Uh, hopefully, this will be full time in the, in the near future. I'm also the CEO of uh, artificial intelligence uh, infrastructure processing startup. So kind of busy. <laughs> um. And you're looking for things to do, which is why you showed up tonight. Thank you, Tim, so much for that. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just, I had nothing else to do. <laughs> I don't have anything else on my plate. So, you know, figured, I, figured I'd, I figured I'd show up and say hi. Well, this concept of the edge of criticality that I talk about in the book, we all, t people tend to do best when they're right there near the edge of between chaos and, and, and order. And uh, people with ADHD, in my opinion, uh, my, my theory is we tend to thrive at the edge of chaos and and uh we do our best work there so we unconsciously seek it but thank you for your giveaway of being present tonight my first question i have here um oh first of all did anybody get a hit on anything i talked about that you want to respond to uh right off the bat 
I think I'll need reminders. I'm sorry. (laughs) Sorry, go ahead. (laughs) No, 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 that's all I need. (laughs) You go ahead. Oh, no, this is just something that I, that kind of uh, sprung up when, when we were talking about just different areas is something that I've dealt with a fair amount, especially as an entrepreneur now, and that is dealing with uh, rejection sensitivity. Uh, because when, you know, going out and pitching to investors, trying to raise money, the plain fact of the matter is that the vast majority of the time you're going to hear no. And so it's, and that's kind of the critic in moving away from a, oh, this person said no, this this angel investor said no because I suck versus this angel investor said no because, oh, it's just not their their area and it's, or they have another investment that maybe conflicts or they just need a little bit more information. So that's something I've found that over the, over the last you know year or two when I've been doing this, I've, I've had to kind of try to transition between those two types of uh, uh, critic, I think. So you, you felt a need to embrace your healthy critic and to mute out the, the unhealthy one, which would be easy for anyone in position going out, uh, like seeking funds like that, doing fundraising, makes sense. Right. Um, so the question I have, uh, how did, uh, I'm trying to come up with questions that are loaded so I can ask you a whole bunch of things at one time, uh, kind of like in a news interview. And what your job is, is to don't be a politician and answer some other question. Um, no, go ahead and answer whatever question comes up for you at this. But um, so compound question how did ADHD factor into you choosing your career? Uh, for me, ADHD was everything uh, in helping me decide my career. I didn't know that I had it. Uh, I knew I knew something was off for years. Um, and I finally got diagnosed in my late twenties. Um, but I obviously started as I think as some people start to in college is where it really started to hit me um that I had a different type of learn I learned differently and I had gone from a journalism major to but I realized that that wasn't for me and the only reason I went into journalism is because I had been told that I wasn't really great at math and science uh, and I should stick with writing and then I like I realized that I was more entertained by the idea of uh, like computers, working with computers or like building things. So I, I, and I couldn't get myself motivated to do my work. So I changed majors because I was like, well, I, I have to do something. I can't just stay in this major that I'm not motivated. I, I can't do anything. So I switched majors. I took a coding class um, and I loved it, even though I wasn't that great at it because it was an entirely new concept to me. Um, my high school didn't teach me anything about coding or computers, which apparently was not everyone else's experience. Um, and then I wound up, I realized that I didn't do well in um, like giant lectures and then taking these big exams all the time. I was better with coding projects where um, I could take time and, and it was like solving a puzzle. And that's where my grades would come from is these large projects that I could submit and I could do them on my own. I could all do them in groups, but, and it wasn't me working off of other people or like taking their work. I was actually, you know, leading groups and I was, uh, I became a, like a teaching assistant, not an official TA because I wasn't a grad student, but I was a teaching assistant. And so once I, found a a, it was basically like a hobby for me and I realized I could make money with it I started focusing on a career path that involved um what I liked to do in college and I was also very lucky that my parents were super supportive because uh not a lot of people get that lucky where they can change majors several times but I did so that's that's kind of how I wound up and I knew that I wanted to work in a company that had a lot of different options so I I aimed for large contracting firms that had a lot of different things that they uh, serve uh, services that they offered, so I could move around if I really needed to, and I knew I wouldn't be stuck in one spot. Cool. So, uh, Aaron, you sort of embody the concept of, of desire motivation versus fear motivation when we get ourselves to do things because we are afraid of the the outcome of not doing them. Um, 
we're versus desire motivation where we're you know we're drawn into something that you know that there's something in it for us and for you it's it's a stimulation and a an a intellectual intrigue um so who who's next uh how did adhd factor into choosing your career or if if that makes you it makes it a superpower for you uh how does that work yeah i mean uh, working in restaurants is kind of like one of the best places for ADHD because there's so much going on and there's so many different tasks that need to be done at any given time that it, for me, it kind of reigns in all the ADHD and allows me to multitask at a higher level than I normally would outside of a restaurant. Um and so it just kind of helps me keep focused and like knowing that there's an end goal and um, just kind of working through it um, got me into, like I started working in kitchens before I even knew I had ADHD, uh, but it was just, it worked really well. So it kind of provides a structure for you in which you can, let your energies flow in a lot of different directions. It sounds like. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, Cause it, it's a lot of like social stuff and then it's, there's lots of creativity and um, like, just like learning, constantly learning new things and studying up on like m different menus or um, different ingredients and stuff like that. So. Very, variety and novelty. Definitely. Who's next? I think I think I'll go and I'll jump off uh, from that variety of novelty. So it wasn't what drew me into a career in banking. However, it's what kept me, uh, which is the variety and novelty of you know. Now I cover half the state of Virginia. I work with fifteen different bank branches, and every single day I'm I'm working with somebody different in a different town in a different region of the state. A completely different request and strategy to work on that it's just it's brand new every single day which uh certainly helps with uh keeping at bay any uh any boredom or monotony that uh, i might have previously been you know averse to variability of performance john you mentioned that as well um and tim you mentioned uh getting no's from angel investors well Sometimes I'm on the other end of that as a, a commercial lender, giving the no and giving the no is just as hard. Uh, well, it's not, but in my mind, it's just as hard as receiving the no, because uh, I believe in the business owners as well. Um, and being able to have that variability of, okay, today was a down day. Tomorrow is a brand new day where I'm going to meet five different new people, five different new businesses and have all these new opportunities to, to put what happened yesterday, you know, behind me has kept me uh, in the career. Uh, and then as well, timeliness, it's something I, I imagine we all have issues with. Uh, I was able to find a career where, hey, the timeliness, uh, it is monitored by other people. So if I'm not timely in my work, I hear from it. Uh, I hear from them. So I sort of get to put push that responsibility off myself um, which frankly keeps me alive. Hmm. I I get that there's something of a calling to this for you also, Matt. There's something of um, in what you do and what you bring to the world that you value highly. It fits into your value set. Yeah, you know, I, I like I said, I work with uh, businesses of up to twenty million dollars in revenue and. And those are traditionally family owned businesses, right? 20 million might sound like quite a lot, but you'll find many family businesses that are, are run with that revenue. So I get to work and help folks achieve their goals that they're in business and, and working to create a life for themselves and their children. You know, they're not as maybe I am as a banker with a $25 billion bank working to create value for my shareholders. My clients are working to create value for their employees and their family members. So, you know, I, I get to see my my advice and decisions help them with that. And, and furthermore, my career, uh, it requires me to be a member of my community. So I'm involved. I'm 
I'm the chair of the Walk to End Alzheimer's. I'm the treasurer of the Kiwanis Club. I work the Rotary. So my job, I get paid to also be involved in nonprofit organizations, uh, which just allows me to create good in my community while, frankly, getting paid for it. Well, so Matt, it's sort of like, I, I think when they make uh, the sequel to It's a Wonderful Life, you're the one that should play George Bailey in that. I, ah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a, he's a good banker, let's put it that way. Tim, tell us about yourself. What, what, uh, oh, wait a minute, did you already speak? No, you didn't. Uh, I, 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 ram I rambled for a minute about something else. <laughs> oh, that's right. And then I lost the question. How does that I, I sort of... how, how's the ADHD play into your career? Um, well, you know, my my initial foray, actually, I, I kind of had a couple roundabout ways of getting into the engineering field, and I think a lot of it was really the ability to i got into it when i was the internet was still kind of young i'm sort of dating myself here so um, go easy on me but the internet was still being built and so i've always been fascinated by connections by building things by you know taking all these different elements and putting something brand new together that's never really been built before and so that's one of the things that really drew me to network engineering and all that sort of stuff so i i started out doing engineering and internet provider, service provider networks. And then once cloud computing became a thing, I started, got into that because it was the same sort of thing. It was something huge and novel that, that nobody had ever really done before. And then I, I found myself a couple of years ago, kind of hitting a wall and I wasn't quite sure what the wall was, but I felt like there was something missing. Like it, it's not that I didn't like what I was doing. It's just that I felt like there was something else that I that I felt more of a more of a calling towards. And eventually I sort of landed on entrepreneurship for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is obviously just the uh, the novel ability of building something that's completely new, this like edge computing, artificial intelligence, infrastructure, something totally new. Um, on top of that, it also gives me the ability to create a company that I've always wanted to work for, but I could never find when it comes to the culture. So it gives me the ability to really build up the culture from the bottom up. And a lot of that does play into ADHD and, and neurodiversity in general, because I feel like as somebody who is neurodiverse and has ADHD, I can be much more accommodating and much more welcoming to people who may struggle in other environments, but who I think could thrive in an, an environment that caters to them uh, in a much more positive way, which you know, kind of goes back to what you were we were talking about a few minutes ago, and so those are, those are the two main reasons that I'm I, I kind of jumped into entrepreneurship, and it was just uh, you know kind of the challenge, and I'm also really able to work in spurts, which is sort of just the way that my brain works. So I can work work in spurts, and and then I can just take a break for a while, and I don't necessarily have anybody telling me like, hey. Like where's your timesheet and <laughs> stuff like that, which is uh which is really a huge help to me. So yeah, you know, we'll see how it goes. It's it, I'm it's still pretty new, but uh, hopefully it'll keep evolving to in the positive direction. So I uh, already filled out a resume and application for your company, Tim. I I want to work for your company. Uh, you get that going. I, um, yeah. Well, yeah, I would I would actually one of the interesting. It's an interesting you say that because one of the things that I that I really also want to not to take up too much time here that I really want to stress is is mental health. And so I would actually would love to have some sort of in house counseling uh, group or uh, life coaching group that my employees can go to free of charge. And whenever they want to, uh, you know, I think that that would be a big help because obviously the insurance industry and all this sort of stuff is, you know, such a complete train wreck nowadays. So it's interesting you say that. So application accepted. <laughs> so, I love not to have timesheets anymore. Those are torture. <laughs> yes. No. Oh, and no. Yeah. No timesheets. I'm. I'm. My. My company is based upon goals, not upon how many hours you work. If you finish your stuff in three hours, go home. Uh, that'd be wonderful. <laughs> well, I'm so going to apply too then. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. This is a recruiting. It's a recruiting call. You will just have to hire security <laughs> people to keep from folks from uh, knocking your door down. Yeah, yeah. 
So you've answered <laughs> some of these questions in 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 what mm -hmm. you said uh, and what you've spoken to, but and and I I'm wishing we had about an hour or so to more to do this, but we we have just um, you know, like eight minutes. Um, but there'll be some more questions come from from our audience. But let me combine these two questions. I want you to think of some of the barriers that you've encountered from ADHD. Something that, you know, we talk about the superpower aspect of it. The, you know, in, in each of your fields, there's something of a of, of what you you as a person with ADHD that 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 sort of brings you into this field in a very good way. Um, but are there any barriers you've encountered? And if so, what kind of accommodations mm -hmm. have you made to be successful in your career? Um, so for me, a big thing was once I got diagnosed, I had to start going to therapy uh, and doctors and therapists aren't always available on the weekends for appointments. So it was hard to, and I, I do weekly sessions and a lot. Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of times, I would, in the beginning, I was sort of worried about how I would get get through this and, you know, tell my coworkers this. So I still haven't told HR. I keep it pretty private, but I'm very close with my coworkers. I've known them for many years now. And one thing that helped me was the fact that I started realizing that my coworkers, on, at least on my team, um, they all have something that, and our company does let us do flexible work hours, which is good. But one thing I noticed is that they all have families. Uh, I work with on a team of all men and they are, but they, they all, they're all family and they all have children, uh, almost all of them. And they all have things that they need to do during the, the middle of the week. Uh, and so I, once I told myself that it's okay, other people have other obligations that are just as important. Um, and that helped a lot. Um, and then the other thing that I struggle with, uh, is, I know a lot of people need like a quiet environment to work in, but I do really well with body doubling. So initially when COVID happened, I was like, oh, thank God, I don't have to travel for a little bit. I can relax. But I realized I really like traveling. And I really like, even if someone isn't working on the same project as me, I really like working in the same room as somebody else. Uh, my fiance, or ooh, sorry, my husband um, is a doctor. So completely different field. And I get a ton of work done when we just sit there and do our own separate thing. So I like going into the office and having a team environment to work on it because I work better with just people around me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so in my role, I have two home offices and then like I said, 12, 12 or 13 branches I cover. In my one home office in Charlottesville, it's, it's the commercial banking hub for Central Virginia. Uh, a lot of much more senior bankers uh, than myself, maybe in their you know, 50s and 60s, been doing it for years, are in that office, about 10 of them. Um, and all of their offices are perfectly immaculate. There's no papers, nothing written, nothing like that. Um, and it's because important in banking, you know, I'm not allowed to tell you who my clients are. I, I can't leave papers around. It's, it's you know, secret information. We don't want to let people know, but I can't work like that. Um, I got my office, um, even back when I was in branch management and banking, I always have a big whiteboard where I write everything on, and then I write the same thing down on a note paper, and then I write the same thing down on a computer, uh, on my Outlook calendar, and whereas my colleagues will leave their doors open at night for the cleaning crew to clean it, I have to clean my own office and keep my door locked because on my whiteboard, I'm going to have clients' names written down and loan amounts and, you know, dollar amounts and all that good stuff because otherwise I will be completely lost. So I, I realized I needed that. And, you know, nobody says anything. Uh, I, I guess that's... I work in an organization that's very open to neurodiversity, thankfully. Um, but also, I, I think it's a matter of just doing your job correctly. People might not say say things to you. But yeah, I, I've learned that I got to clean my own office because I would be lost without writing things all over the place. Cool. 
Um, in the restaurant industry, uh, substance abuse is a big problem. And people with ADHD tend to struggle with it more than uh, normal people. Um, and it, alcohol especially, has like definitely affected my life a little bit. Um, and it can just make things a lot harder because if you go out the night before, it makes the next day harder to get a lot done because you're foggy and it's hard to focus. It's already hard to focus, but then you're foggy on top of it. So um, alcohol was definitely, um, especially when I was younger, uh, a problem. How, how do you cope with it now? How that's a, if that's a, an ADHD and it makes sense. There's, there's, uh, you know, research supports that those of us with ADHD tend to have greater tendency toward addiction than neurotypicals. Um, what, what works for you? Um, <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> um, right now, like I've actually been sober for 11 weeks now um, for just like external health stuff. And it makes, it's been making life a lot easier in a lot of ways. Um, it just like, I'm less tired or fatigued um, and I can get more stuff done, stuff done in a lot of ways. Um, so this is I have a, no idea if I answered the question. No, you did. This <laughs> was, uh, spot on, Drew. This is a this is an accommodation that you've created for uh, a a sort of a occupational hazard. Mm -hmm. cool. Definitely, because I mean, when you're with bartenders, bartenders are always encouraging you to drink more. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Has everyone responded to that question? I lost track for a minute. So uh, we're right on 8.30. We want to open up to questions from from our audience. Um, do, we, do we have any questions yet? <clears throat> I've got a few more. If not, that's okay. Uh, my first question is Cheryl. Do you do you know you're on mute? There you yes, go. I finally got my computer's a little sticky today. Oh. Um, okay. So let me go to the questions now. I had them and then. Okay. There are a couple of questions. How else can we support those with ADHD in the workplace? And which tech ex assistance do you recommend? And we decided anybody who wants to from the panel can just jump in. I I get a lot of hate for this in my field, but I really like my, working with Max, uh, at least from my, we call it a gold load image, um, which is your comp when you work for a bunch of clients, you have a bunch of client laptops. Uh, when you test, you have your own testing laptop that's separate, but for day-to-day -day emails and uh, company-wide things, the Mac is amazing. It's It kind of organizes itself. Um, so I find Apple products to be really easy to use um, just for keeping me organized. Um, that being said, I work mostly with Windows and other Unix systems, but that's a big thing. Um, noise canceling headphones are amazing. Um, earplugs, uh, I like them when I sleep, but I don't really necessarily, oh, if you work in like, I go into server rooms, so I, I like earplugs for that, but noise canceling headphones and Apple products are just for the organization alone is really nice. And they do have a lot of accessibility features that I wrote down for my boss to convince him to get me one, but I haven't necessarily tapped into all of them, but there are a lot. <laughs> Those are all great, great ideas. Does anyone else have technology that they use or notebooks, which I use, but anyone else? 
Yeah, uh, I've actually just recently, so the past year, I've been getting much better at using a calendar and like scheduling out my days and scheduling out my weeks. And the hardest part of that with ADHD is when you set yourself up with a bunch of tasks and then you miss a task or miss a couple of tasks and then you forget to move that to the next day or the following day after that or whatever. And uh, about two weeks ago, I found a new app that's ran um, through AI that you plug into your Google Calendar and you put all your tasks into your Google Calendar and then it automatically, if you miss a task for a day, it automatically moves your schedule around for the rest of the week so that you still get that task in in the future. And just in the last like two weeks, it has been wild the more stuff that I've been um, uh, been able to get done. Uh, it's called uh, Reclaim. Uh, and it, the, I think the website's like reclaim.ai. So it's, uh, I think, I think AI in general is going to be a big deal for everybody, but I think for ADHD people earlier on, it's going to be super helpful. I use, uh, I've used ChatGPT not to write reports, but, uh, when I go back to the little corporate things like, Oh, do you have goals? Sometimes you don't have like the patience or the ability to just spit out what you're you're how to, well to, like format what you're thinking clearly uh -huh. so i've used chat gbt to plug in a bunch of my ideas and then it has put them it's kind of like when you do uh like word puzzles where the words rearranged it doesn't necessarily like you can resort the letters um and it doesn't necessarily spell the word for you out but uh when you see it change, you can like, oh, okay, that gives me another idea of where to go from there. That and Timular, I just bought uh, Timular, the the actual physical device, but there's an app that I think is free for some portions. And basically the dice, it's like a, it looks like a D and D dice and you put, you assign it different tasks and you turn it every time you switch gears when you're working, you just turn it over and it's it's really cool because it's a physical reminder and it, it doesn't require you to like actually write down what you've changed to and you can do it really quickly so i like those two things but i do really love all the ai stuff that's that's coming out we're in anyone else have tips on what they on accommodations they use at work that seems to be a big interest of everybody if I could ask that um, while you're giving these great um, advice and all these different apps and things that you use, if you wouldn't mind to uh, to type them in the chat, because uh, I know the audience is curious. I know that the Reclaim AI, Drew just put in there, but if there's anything that you want to share that somebody can like get a link or, or you know, cut and paste, um, that'd be great. Like Timular. Yeah, I'm going to put, I'm on my iPad right now. So I'm just going to type time. Ugh, it's going to autocorrect. Um, but I can send the link. <laughs> Sorry. We are in the age of apps. There's an app for everything. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll do chat GBT, but I'm pretty sure everyone knows what that is. Um, all right, that. Don't correct. There we go. Okay, I have another question. Um, hold on a second. Tim, this is for Tim. Any tips for starting your own business? I'm in the midst of starting my own, but feeling overwhelmed by all the steps and organizing it to be manageable. And while on that note, balancing a full time job while starting your own thing part time, pretty rough. Any help with this? Uh, that's a really good question. And I would say, and this is it's easier said than done, but I would say the first thing is, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that you have an idea of what, of what you want to do, is having an idea of what you want to do, and then just understanding and researching the steps that you need to do to incorporate a business, um, to register name, uh, things, things of those 
that nature because as people with ADHD, and I can attest to this, we tend to sometimes overlook that sort of stuff, <laughs> but it's actually really, really important. So I would say the first thing is to just get that that out of the way. And then another very important thing to do is if you haven't already is start to look for one or two other people who are have the same interest. Ideally that maybe you've worked with before in the past or that you just, you know, personally in order to find somebody who's a co-founder, because I found that when I was a solo preneur, when it was just me trying to do this, it was, it was not tenable. It just wasn't, it wasn't doable. So trying to find somebody who can complement your skill sets I found it best to to find somebody who's a little bit more neurotypical because they're you know he's he's better at uh, at at organizing and getting all of that stuff uh, stuff done. But I think another really important thing is to make sure that you give yourself downtime because it's really, really easy to burn yourself out. So if you're you know, I have these tasks I need to do. I need to get incorporated. I need to look into what I need to do to get this license or that license, getting a co-founder, um, you know, all sorts of, you know, accounting, that sort of stuff is very important. But if you try to do too much at one time, you're really going to burn yourself out. So you have to have some patience, especially when you're first starting out. So those, that would be me, be my suggestions. Hopefully that's not too nebulous. Honestly, it really is something that that I think it, it depends on the individual and you just need to be able to figure out how much you can do at once and be okay with that. And then just kind of go patiently from there and just figure out the initial steps. And then once you get to that point, then you can start working on on the product or the technology or, or whatever it is. So that would be, that would be my uh, suggestions. I would say to probably need to collect or look into your NDAs and your non-competes if you're working like for a consulting firm, definitely collect all that information ahead of time. Yeah. So that's a, that's a great point as well. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, you don't want to get caught up in that. Like if you work for a big company, it's like, you're not going to win that legal battle. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So make sure, make sure you Someone do with a law degree too, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Right. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I, I hope, I hope that that was a, a good enough answer. I, again, I know that some of that is a little bit nebulous and it really does depend on, on what it is that you're, you're interested in doing, but I think it really is important to just make sure. So you, so you, you really, really, you really love what it is that you're trying to do as another thing, because if you don't have a ton of passion about it and it, you're just, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work out because you just have to put so much effort into it. So it has to be something that you really, really care about. I'm not saying that you don't, but I'm just saying that's a hugely important thing that sometimes people will overlook and they'll say, oh man, this is a big market. I can make a lot of money, but the money is only going to take you so far. You have to actually really, really be into it. You have to really, really care. It has to be something that you're serious about. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds quick, great. Uh, just one more uh, idea, just throw out uh, the Mason Enterprise Institute on university. I think that's the name of it, Pam, if, if I'm, it's where uh, ARG used to be uh, uh, housed, but they uh, offer consult to business, pe people starting up businesses. Um, yeah. John, that's part of the Small Business Development Center. I was going to jump in. Um, Tim said it right, you know, obviously finding co-founders, other folks, but getting involved with the, um, you know, groups that are focused on the same industry as you are. For example, here in Charlottesville, we have a uh, tech and business innovation council where all entrepreneurs in the tech space get together. I'm also part of the Seville Biohub where all the entrepreneurs in the biological and, uh, you know, scientific health sciences entrepreneurs get together. So it's getting together with folks who are doing the same thing as you are. Because as Tim said, you can be a solopreneur. That's going to be a tough road to get down. So find some other folks doing the same thing you are and just bounce ideas off of them and, and work along with that. Great. Um, there's some more questions. Um, are there any tips and tricks for keeping one's inbox organized? Okay. I have, uh, I've, Worked with tons of filters uh, at work because I can't use any AI. Uh, they sometimes work, sometimes they don't. Uh, I 
for example, fill out all of my late notices for my timesheets. I put them in a separate mailbox. Um, at home, I've actually tried, uh, started using something called, I think it's called SaneBox. I don't know if it's worth it necessarily. I've been using it for a couple weeks now. Um, honestly, I probably just have to turn it off to see how disorganized my Gmail would be without it. Um, but it seemed like an interesting tool. I th think it does help. Um, it's better at creating filters. And honestly, you can probably use it to teach yourself what, what it's filtering on because it does show you and then use it. Again, it's partially paid for, but it's not expensive. And then learn what filters it's using and maybe do it yourself after first, however long you want to do that. Um, yeah, inbox is awful. I try and use filters, but you have to be careful. Uh, like just because people mistype, you know, subjects in there, which is, drives me nuts. And then you can't, the filter doesn't work. <laughs> right. Does anyone else have an idea about inboxes? Oh, I'll type same box. Do any of you use time tracking tools? And if so, which ones? So that was uh, Timular. I did, that was my response for that. Right. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else. I use Sweepy, but that's for at home chores. <laughs> Well, that's good too, if you could get that in the chat box. Sure. Uh, let me do, let me just make sure I'm typing scene box, right? Yeah, I am. Okay. Scene box. I also, I don't know if this is how many women there are here, but I use another app, another app called, um, where'd it go? It's for basically you input your entire closet into it and Cladwell. And for me, especially when I was going into the office more, I would waste a lot of time in the morning trying to figure out what to wear professionally. Cladwell, you just plug everything into your whole wardrobe into it, and then it'll uh, suggest outfits for you based on the weather and your location and things and what you have in your closet. Amazing. Um, sorry? That is, that's amazing. Yeah, it's a pretty cool app. I, um, I have, again, and I use Pinterest as well. Like, I'll go on Pinterest. It makes me sound really basic but i'll go on pinterest and find outfits that look like what i own and then i'll save that and i'll use that for suggestions as well i, I especially for a woman i think you know not that men can't be cool when they dress but i think women sometimes will have a hard time uh with so many options on what to wear professionally it saves me a ton of time to have those suggestions already on hand Great. pam did i miss any questions Oh, I think there's a new one. Hold on. Any resources referrals for someone diagnosed with ADHD late in life, 25 years into the work world? Um, who needs to be reset, reset professionally, figuring out the right fit later in life with the realities of adult life and the lack of flexibility time-wise and financially? Hmm, that's a loaded question. Somebody who needs to reset, who's a late diagnosis, any advice? John, how about you? Thoughts I have are that um, that that is isn't um, that that's sort of the norm uh, that we're we're getting into more and more. We we tend to be evolving as as a uh, in in the world of work and as a society toward more uh younger generations wanting to do things that are meaningful in their work and not just work to live and so of course people are catching on to that idea as they get older and we're we're more and more into lifelong learning any job any career we're in is going to require retooling periodically and because there's there's so much happening, so many things changing in the world of work that we, we need to do that just to keep up. Um, it's the same in my career. And, and I'm sure with everyone else's, your ideas, um, you know, some of the business ideas you all brought in were, were are based on that, that, you know, that that change. So all I can say is that the um, the right fit later in life within the realities of adult of adult life 
it's a hard thing to pack everything in. And sometimes you're looking at, it looks like you're putting 10 pounds in a five pound bag. Um, but that's one of the, that's one of the superpowers of ADHD. We tend to find ways to make that happen. Um, and I, I don't know if I have a single suggestion for that, ex except to say that that's a common thing that people face and will continue to face as we stay longer in the workforce. Uh, I'm 71 years old and people ask when I'm retiring and I say, well, I'm, I'm gonna work till noon on the day of my funeral. Um, the idea is to find something you love and I, who, who would wanna retire from, from something you love? Um, so whatever the challenges you face in, in fitting that into your life, it is very much worth uh, the outcome of doing what you want to do that's meaningful in life. Um, I can add like a little bit. Uh, I wasn't diagnosed late in life, but I didn't start treating it until late in life, later in life. Um, I've only been treating it for the past two years, I think. And and I was diagnosed when I was like 15. And um, a big part of it was finding a therapist who really understands ADHD um, was, is super helpful because I went through seven or eight different therapists who did not understand ADHD at all. And they were more or less useless to me. Um, and then finding the right medication and the right dosage has been huge as well. Um, cause there's lots of different med medications for ADHD and everybody kind of has their own reactions to different ones. Um, and so like finding the right one is pretty important as well. Thank you. I have a question. Um, does anyone have any advice for balancing um, work with family obligations, especially um, people who have their own their own businesses? Scheduling it, <laughs> uh, making sure it's like on your calendar and on your schedule, um, almost as if it's part of your job, um, makes it super easy for me to make sure that I do those things or participate in those things. Vito, what wow. Drew says, setting up date night for your significant other one night a week, I have a dinner with my son one night a week. It's just a matter of scheduling it in and building time around it. We look at what's important in life. What's the crystal of our life? We tend to do what's crystal and what is most important. So just calling it out and putting it on the calendar is the very best thing you can do. Yeah, my, my husband and I, sorry, it's weird to call my husband now. Uh, we, <laughs> we are doing long distance right now. Um, and so obviously we have the open option of calling each other mostly whenever. I don't always like cold calling, it throws me off my game. So um, we definitely schedule date nights. Um, obviously we schedule visits a couple of times a month, but the big thing is putting it on our calendar. And unfortunately, I don't know anything about dealing with children and ADHD uh, and having that, but that's what I do. I, I put it on the calendar and it, it definitely helps. Like it's not, not, it doesn't make things not romantic. It helps, I think, because it shows you, like it shows yourself that you're making this a priority and you're a significant other that it's a priority. So a shared calendar for me is really great. And all of my coworkers have shared calendars uh, that include their children on it, if that helps. Are there any other questions? In the absence of other questions, I'd like to pose a final question to the panel and just, you know, brief as you want to be. Um, just first of all, I want to say thank you again and, and acknowledge what exemplary people you are. And as the exemplary person that you are, and what you've accomplished in your life as a person with ADHD, despite having ADHD. Um, looking back in time, what advice would you give your younger self 
going through some of the struggles you went through from the vantage point of your wisdom and accomplishments right now? Hmm. I'll save the hard one for last. <laughs> yeah, Aaron and I are both just cracking up here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, if I if I had to choose like something easy, I would say be kinder to yourself because being self-critical is something I've struggled with for a long, long time. And so uh, just go easy on yourself. Don't be so hard on yourself. And realize that other people have maybe not even the same issues, but they have other issues that are important. So it Again, for me, body, body doubling is huge. So it's like if other people are going through the same thing and I think about it that way, it's really helpful for me. Not that I want other people to suffer, but just like, I'm not suffering alone. <laughs> mm -hmm. No one likes to be alone with painful feelings and suffering. <laughs> yeah. An earlier diagnosis would have been nice too, but I can't really do anything about that. <laughs> Drew and Matt, you can't leave without without answering. So you know, just make something up if you have to. Yeah, I'll say something. I'm sure, John, you remember. Or it's all right if you don't. From over a decade ago now. Um, Clearly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> you never know when real life is going to start. So just. Start living your life now, whatever achievements you have, that's a real achievement and that's real life. Because um, what you think are achievements in terms of what you see other folks doing professionally that might be at the time unattainable due to you're not managing your uh, neurodiversity well, doesn't mean you're not achieving real life and not experiencing the totality what it means to to be alive so thank you i would say i would probably tell myself that i don't have to be the best at everything um for a very long time i just had to be the best at what i was doing and i wasn't happy with anything less than that um and I probably miss out on a lot of stuff because of it. Thank you for your wisdom um, on that. And thank you also for being here and sharing yourselves with uh, with the group. And uh, it, it, it's been very, very uh, uh, just humbling and an honor to, to be present with you. So thank you again. And um, I um, hope, hope you all got what you hear, uh, folks in the audience, hope you got what you came for. And uh, if you didn't get an answer, we're, uh, I'm sure you'll have an email that you can send questions to. Um, and thank you for your attention and your presence. Uh, and that's all we have for you.